first question would uh, just be to allow you to explain your motivation for seeking re-election this time around. And is it something that you deliberate about uh, a, a lot, or is it automatic that this is where you belong and there's not a lot of thought that goes into no, it? No, I know it appears that it's automatic. It really isn't. <laughs> no, it's a, a long process. Why now? Because I, I'm in a senior position in the Congress as a result of seniority, and I'm in the midst of probably the most important uh, battle for legislation in regulatory reform, and I happen to write half of the regulatory reform bill, so I want to make sure I'm in a position to see it through to enactment. And I knew that we wouldn't get to it, you know, very early in the year. We're not even certain that we'll be able to complete it this year, although I'm very optimistic that we will. And uh, that helps that process, I think, if I'm not a lame duck member. Uh, you know, lame duckness, whether it be in the presidency or in the Congress, is extremely significant in terms of whether or not you get the attention of leadership, committee chairman, and the general public. Uh, because of the uh, potential influence or effect you may have on the future determines how people weigh your credit. Uh, so that's really why I decided uh, that it was to the benefit of my district, it's to the benefit of the country if I continue through on the on track we're on to get this done. Did you tell uh, people during the last election cycle that it would be your last? No. no. I never make declarations like that. I don't believe in that. If, if you announce that, then you're a lame duck. Uh, people in certain circles are suggesting that the debate over health care reform and a resulting vote have made incumbent Democrats more susceptible uh, to losing their congressional seats. Do you have a sense of that? Do you have a sense that uh, your campaign might be more vulnerable than in years past? You know, I think that's probably the conventional prevailing theme, but I don't agree with it. One, even if it were uh, the conventional theme and true, I wouldn't pay much attention to it. I, I think you have, you know, this is an unusual opportunity in a lifetime, particularly my lifetime. We're going to be passing probably the third most important, uh, well, we have passed the third most important social piece of legislation that this country has ever enacted, and I was able to participate in that. And, uh, and I think it's important, and I think the input of all of us that were over the years in putting this together were very helpful. I was very involved in the Clinton health care plan, and I saw it evolve into what we have today. Uh, yes, people, and particularly politicians, uh, uh, and when I say politicians, not necessarily the elected officials, but party structure, leadership, both at the national and state level, have been uh, fermenting this idea, oh, this is your death. As a matter of fact, I think when we had one of the votes, everybody on the Republican side waved bye-bye, you know, the traditional. I, uh, that's nonsense. If, if anyone could tell me what this bill will uh, uh, be received like in six months, I'd give them a year's wage. They can't do that. My own impression is that it, it, it was poorly managed from the standpoint that we did not adequately, and when I say we, everybody, from the President, through the Congress, through the people who had interest in it, and the health providers themselves that had an interest in it. We never explained it adequately to the American people. Now, uh, there's a reason for that, and a damn good excuse. The bill's 2,600 pages and encompasses 16 or 17 percent of the gross domestic product of the United States. So it's not something that can be easily explained. Most people don't sit around their kitchens during the day and discuss uh, the attributes of health expenses and delivery systems. Uh, they just, when they get sick, they want to be able to go to the doctor, they want to go to the hospital, and they want to get treated. But there's a very complex mechanism that underlies that. And we were faced with uh, trying to structure that without shocking the system, because those of us that have been in Congress over 15 years saw the Clinton bill uh, come out of uh, uh, confidentiality and closely held idea structure to, to try and get into legislation and never did because of the methodology used to get it to the point. So with this one, we saw it moving. Quite frankly, it's quite moderate in nature. It's not extreme, even though the average person had the bejesus scared out of them by uh, misstatements, misinformation. That will tend to go away, as people understand. I just, uh, coming into the building, just had a guy stop me on the street and he said, my wife and I are retiring. 
and he said, Congressman, I wanted to talk to you. He said, what do I do? I, should I take the Advantage program or should I take the supplemental program? Well, I have to be honest with you, I don't, I, I don't know his facts and circumstances, so I didn't try and advise him as to what to do. But, and I said, well, you know, the Advantage program, do you, it's going, he said, is it true it's going to be done away with? Yes, I said. And he said, well, why? You know, said, well, because it was a supplemental program made available to uh, re, uh, keep, keep down prescription drug costs before we passed the prescription drug bill. It's really had no justification for existence for the last t 10 years, but it was in the bill and in the law and it never changed. And the insurance companies were making extraordinary profits based on that part of the uh, payment schedule. We're taking that out and using those proceeds to cover 32 million other people and to close the uh, gap in the prescription drug bill. Now, I know you've spent the last several weeks uh, making a point to get to different uh, audiences and explain um, what, the, what the bill includes and, and the potential benefits to them. I, I don't want to rehash that information necessarily. I'm curious about what areas you believe uh, of this bill might need to be reworked, if any, or if there's companion legislation, if any, that you think the job is yet to be completed? Yeah. Well, it is a, a, a work of sculpture, and it's going to have to be worked on oh, several times over the next 10 years. I don't know that we, uh, even if we'll get it absolutely right after 10 years. Matter of fact, we'll never stop perfecting it. Just like Social Security has been changed and modified nine times since it was born, uh, that, that's going to occur in this bill because if for no other reason there is no uh, uh, stable or, or solidified base, the population is always changing, the, the needs change, the uh, research and development in, in medicine change, and all of that will necessitate changes in, in how we pay for it, how we deliver it, and what we do, and what involvement we have in it. Do you have priorities in terms of the things that you think need to be addressed first? Well, I, I would like to see a way that we do get medical coverage, minimal coverage to everybody. We haven't accomplished that. Uh, I think ultimately that will be seen as important after the first pandemic. Uh, but maybe before we have that, if we if we looked at it and saw the importance, now that could be handled by many means. It doesn't mean we have to force everybody into insurance. Uh, we can have health clinics. Uh, available for there are ways of doing that. I think we should think about it. Uh, I, I tell a lot of stories about you know the coming of the next pandemic and what it means, uh, and, and and we're apt to have one of those happen. You know, I have a little daughter, and she's a scientist, and she's out in New Mexico, at Los Alamos, and uh, she's lucky enough to, uh, as a hobby, uh, play around with things like beehives. And I was just visiting her recently. And she was telling me that she lost eight of her nine beehives. Yeah, it doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people. If I say that around here, we're not going to. But it is shocking, the amount of bees and beehives that we've lost in the world, not only the country. And that suddenly, since I think 75% of our food product and our, 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 our fiber product are directly related to pollinization by bees. If we don't have we have no substitute. And we don't yet know what's causing that. Uh, you know, you don't want to wake up without food and without fiber to start putting the emphasis in that. And that's where pandemics are occurring, not only in the human life, but in, 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 uh, in insect life, in bird life, and all of these things. So uh, as we get more sophisticated along the line, that's why we will have to change these things. We may have the most asinine delivery system. I don't know, was it you that suggested the idea that maybe uh, the uh, electromagnetic field is having a terrible effect on that. Well, maybe it is. Well, hell, you know, 20 years ago we didn't crowd the field the way we have today. Just think of what we're walking through every day, and and what what reaction is it having on our cells, on our DNA? We don't really know. We're, that's advancement of time and process, and health is directly connected to that. So yeah, we'll have to change it.